Good morning and welcome to the 1002, 1002 service at the Union Church of South Foxborough. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on live stream. It's great to have you joining us from wherever you are. We're happy to come to the house of the Lord and worship him and thank him for all the blessings in our lives. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may gather in this place today. Thank you that you are holy, you are perfect in all your thoughts, you are perfect in all your ways, and your truth given in your word is the most important thing we can receive in our lives. Help us to receive it today, even as we give you our praise and our gratitude. So bless this service, we pray. To we who are here and to those who are watching from elsewhere, we give you thanks in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some quick announcements to share with you. There's a new women's fall Bible study beginning. It's based on a study by Jennifer Rothschild, Rothschild entitled Take Courage. There's more information about it on our church website, on the women's ministry page. And those organizing it are asking if women could sign up, please. Uh, you can use the email blast or you can use the website link by September 9, so we have an idea of how many are coming so it can be properly prepared for. Hey, I know summer's coming to an end, at least here in New England. Do you like fall? Does anybody here like fall? I can count on one hand the number of hands that went up. Um, do you like apples, maybe? If you do, there's an event for you. It's on September 14 at 1 p.m. It's one of our small group innovations. There's going to be a fall apple recipe swap September 14. That's a Saturday at 1 p.m. So if you like fall and you like baking or cooking with apples or eating things, and not this is my category, eating things with baked and with cinnamon especially, um, the deadline to sign up for that is September 7th. There's information on the website. That's a fall apple recipe swap, September 14 at 1 p.m. Do you know anyone with small children up to the age of seven? Kinder Music is beginning this fall at Union Church. Our youth pastor's uh, wife, Allie, is teaching it. Allie is uh, quite schooled in this, and it's to teach music, if I'm saying it properly, to infants all the way through the age of seven. There's information on the website also for that, so spread the word to anyone you know of with small children. Also, Wednesday night Bible study, we're meeting on Wednesdays. That's when Wednesday night Bible study is on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. It's in person in the hall, or you can join us by Zoom. We're finishing up a study in the next few weeks on the life of Abraham. Also, one thing that is not on the wall behind me, but you don't want to miss it, is we have a new prayer wall. This is for people to put prayer requests on anonymously, or if you wish to put your name, you can. And it's for people in recovery who meet here who may wish to put a prayer request up, or for ourselves. And we'd like people to take note of it, to maybe uh, take a picture and then pray for them. It's a beautiful wall made by Wes Bishop, who's in the back this morning and is going to put his hand up. You, it's a beautiful thing. It matches very nicely with work his grandfather did on the woodwork many, probably 30 years ago now. So take a look at it when you go out to the fellowship hall in Wes. We're very grateful for that, for you doing that for us. I saw it last night. It's beautiful. So thank you for that. Pastor Stephen is going to read for us from Luke chapter 9. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am indeed reading from Luke 9, um, starting in chap verse 1. It's on page 733 in the Blue Bibles in front of you if you would like to follow along. Or if you use your phone like I and Pastor Bill do. Um, or you have your own Luke, 1, or Luke 9, 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. 
and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this that I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew to a, by themselves to a, a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to their surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all of this crowd. About five thousand men were there. But he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Right. And now if you would please stand and join us for worship.
habit at Union Church, and it's a habit we're going to stay with in this case, which is that we pray, and we pray for people's requests. Um, we have an ongoing prayer list. If your prayer request uh, doesn't get prayed for in the Sunday service, we always pray for them during the week. There's a few of us that do that. And... Um, so we'll pray for some of those today. A very tragic thing happened last night, I guess in actually in Rentham, where a car was stolen and a car full of people was hit by the driver and a little boy I heard was killed, 10-year-old boy was killed. We're gonna pray for that family. We also have a family here with a baby waiting to be born. We're gonna pray for that mother and child and some of our other ongoing prayer requests. In Psalm 29, which we read the opening of last week, we finish with, written by King David, the voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that what was true 3,000 years ago in the time of King David is true in our time that we live today and all the world is subject to your sovereignty your wisdom, your intentions. And when you speak, humanity trembles before you. And those who know and love you cry together as we sang this morning, glory to the name of the Lord, who is enthroned as king forever. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you bless us with strength, with endurance for the world in which we live, we are in the world, but not of the world. And so we worship you today, you who are holy, you who are perfect in all your ways, you whose thoughts have never changed, your standards and your purposes have never changed or varied. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, you are a God of justice, and mercy. You're the God of wisdom and grace. Thank you that through you we may find forgiveness. Through the Son you foretold in the Old Testament and brought to us at your perfect timing in the first century AD, who lived among us and taught us about you with perfect wisdom and knowledge, for he was God in human form and who gave his life on the cross that we may find forgiveness and we might find life eternal, cleansed of sin and present with you in heaven forever and ever and ever. Thank you that you sit enthroned over all humanity. Thank you that you are on your throne, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together as one King, one God, forever and ever and ever. We bless you, we praise you, we give you our humility and our sincere gratitude this very day. Father, we can't imagine what it would be like, we don't wish to imagine, what it would be like to lose a son so unexpectedly, safe in a car one moment, and the subject of a terrible accident the next. We hold this family before you who were struck out on Route 1. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant them a comfort beyond anything any human words can give. We pray for those who remain injured and hospitalized as a result of this, that you would bring mending and healing to their bodies. Grant them peace. Grant them comfort. We pray for the perpetrator of this who stole a vehicle that you would so work in his heart and life that he would take responsibility, but more than that, he would find peace and forgiveness in you for the sake of his soul. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, for a, a dear young mother this morning preparing to have a baby. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would time this according to your great wisdom, and you would bless, and you would provide, and you would care, and you would be with mother and child and family moment by moment until all is well. So bless them and watch over them this very week. We continue to pray for Annie's dad, Ed, as he recovers from a fall and injuries, that you might heal his bones and his body and allow him mobility. We pray for our elder, Kevin Gorney, that you would bless him with health issues he has been having with fatigue ongoing. Father, grant a solution and grant well-being to him. For Mark Frauman, as he recovers from eye surgery and as Mark and Deb go through various changes literally within their home, bless them, we pray. Provide for them, grant them your peace in all things. Father, for Allie's mom, as she recovers from a knee surgery she had just this week, and as she looks ahead to another, we pray that you would pr protect her from any infection, that you would reduce any side effects and allow her quickly to recover and be ready for the final surgery on her leg. Bless her, we would pray. For a young woman in her 20s going through a difficult time with fear in her heart and her little child, we would pray today that you would Bless and keep her and them, mother and daughter together. Bless them and keep them, we pray. We continue to pray, Heavenly Father, for others, such as a Boston police officer very seriously injured while on duty, who has a friend who is among us. Father, bless him and continue to heal his body. For Maureen, as she recovers from surgery, grant her blessing and wellness. For Joanne and her daughters, Cheryl and Alice, as they care for her, continue to grant Joanne mobility and allow her to be at home, we would pray today. Father, for Carrie, who's in the hospital, Dave's friend. Father, you know what's happening with him perfectly. We pray that you would bless him and allow treatment to be effective for his health and well-being. Father, we continue to pray for each one on our list that you would intercede according to wisdom greater than our own, that people may know there is a God who loves them. And may we represent you well in each situation so that we may be reflections of our Lord who has taught us and is teaching us his ways. Father, be with those in recovery who meet here. Grant them continued choices to be well. Grant that lives would be spared even as we see it again and again and that lives would be changed not by a vague higher power but by the revelation of the true creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the lives of people. Father, be with our nation. We are so in need of spiritual awakening and renewal. We need a great turning away from human wisdom and to your wisdom and to who you are over us. Father, bring this about even as we've seen signs of it coming. May it be successful. May many millions turn to Jesus Christ, we would pray. Father, we worship you by praying as our master Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Whose Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When I've done the offering prayer in the past, I usually try to find a passage.
to read that relates directly through and to an offering. But this morning I wanted to, to share kind of an overview of um, the Old Testament in quick form. Um, the God, our God promised the Israelites the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey to the 12 tribes of Israel. One of the tribes, the Levites, did not inherit any of the land. What they did, they inherited God. So the Levites were responsible for the carrying, the setting up of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the most holy place, and the Ark of the Covenant. And they would follow the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire day by day or by night and go where they, travel to where they had to go to where God told them to stop and then again set all of that up. And the Levites were also responsible for the priestly duties in um, leading worship. So all of the other tribes had to, uh, not had to, the, uh, all of the other tribes were told by God to offer one-tenth of their harvests and their flocks and bring them and offer them as a sacrifice or offer them um, in the most holy place, well, in the tabernacle, on the altars for prayer offerings, um, sin offering. Um, but the, the priestly duties of the Levites, that was their food. And the other offerings, that's how they were able to continue leading worship. So our offerings, obviously God doesn't need money. We don't buy our way into heaven. We don't buy our forgiveness. We perform our offerings and gifts to support the worship, to support the leaders of worship, to support God's ministry, his work. So that being said, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for your abundant blessings. Thank you for your wisdom, your grace, your love, mercy, and forgiveness. Please accept our gifts and offerings as a sign of our love and faith to you and to Union Church. Please accept them so that we may continue growing our humble church, growing our congregation, and growing in our faith and love of you. All of these things I pray in your son's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, Danny, for that, for leading us in prayer. So um, you have a very nice outline in the bulletin of the sermon. And um, someone whose name I'm not going to mention, because he would be embarrassed if I outed him actually changed the sermon and didn't tell his wife who makes up the bulletin. So what you have in the bulletin is actually an outline of next a series that, I, that this person is going to begin next week. But we've been doing a topical series, and this person is now going to give a topical message whose name I'm not going to mention because he messed up this week. Sorry about that, honey. <laughs> But if you wish to take notes, I'll try to make the points clear and the scripture clear that I'm quoting from, because I encourage taking notes and going back over it if you so wish. We've done a few topics, and today we're going to talk about overcoming that sense of guilt, the sense of guilt that we may carry. A sad story, but true story. A little girl's mother was very sick, and... In fact, the adults knew that the mother's life was coming to a conclusion due to her illness. It was not curable. The mother sadly treasured every moment she had with her little girl who was only five years old, and the little daughter had no real concept because she was so small of what was happening except that mommy was very sick. 
On this particular day, the little girl happened to look out the window and her best friend and her best friend's mother were walking by on the sidewalk on the way to the playground just up the street. So she asked her mother, can I go with my friend? And her mother gave permission, knowing the other mother would welcome her daughter and would take care of her and watch over the two girls at the playground. This was a habit of the two families. While the little girl was at the playground, mommy died. Grandpa and grandma were there, a nurse was there, daddy was there, but the little girl had no real idea. I guess others didn't know it would be so quick. Afterwards, daddy came, walked the little girl home, and when he got her home from the playground, he told her that mommy was gone, and the little girl burst into tears, and she said, if I hadn't gone to the playground, I could have helped mommy. And that little girl, now in her 50s, still carries a sense of guilt. She knows in her head she did nothing wrong, but in her little heart from that early stage of life, she felt somehow if only she'd been home, mommy would still be here. Sad story, and we carry guilt. We carry guilt that we've earned, every one of us, for things we've said and done that are wrong, other things we are not responsible for, but we take on a sense of false guilt. It may be something we said or did last week. It may be something we did in the last century, early in our life, if we were living back then. And whether it's true or false, guilt, it's equally, it can be equally painful. Guilt is a thief. It steals our peace of mind. It keeps us awake at night. It keeps us from feeling good about ourselves. It can even keep us from the closeness in our relationship with God because after all, God is perfect and I did this thing or said this thing and I feel guilty so God must not want me too close to him. It can cause us to withdraw from people if we're feeling guilty and keep us from living our fullest life. The great Charles Stanley, who I highly recommend, preached on a whole series of topics. He did it for many, many years, and one that I read recently was on guilt. He isn't here to deliver the sermon, or I would invite him to, but I'd like to share some what I think are biblical thoughts today of my own on the subject of guilt. A couple weeks ago, I texted a guy. I don't really know him well, but I was thinking of him. I texted him to sort of check on him, and the day went by, no answer. Went to bed at night, he hadn't answered me, and I began thinking to myself, he, thinks, he must think I'm nosy. He thinks it's odd that I texted him. Maybe I caught him at a moment that it kind of bugged him, and so I had these thoughts, false guilt, right? At 5.11 the next morning as I was drinking my coffee, Boom, my phone beeped. There was a text. Thank you for thinking of me. That was really nice. Here's how I'm doing. We can so easily take on false guilt. Let's think for a moment about reasons that we feel guilty. We may have a sense of false guilt. We know in our head it was okay to go to the playground. We were only five years of age after all. We had no responsibility. But though we know in our head we didn't do something, in our heart we're, we're plagued by a sense of guilt. The dog ran out in the street, slipping its collar. We were calling the dog back, and something happened to the dog, and we feel guilty, although it's the dog that ran, and we did our best to get the dog back. We feel guilty. Somebody at our party said something to someone else. We weren't even in the room, but that person was hurt by what was said, and so we feel badly. We feel guilty, though we're not responsible. There are all sorts of things that we take on false guilt when we are not actually responsible for something going wrong. Maybe when we were 13, we shot our shot our friend in the face with a BB gun. Our friend is fine all these years later, but we still have a sense of guilt. Maybe a bad decision impacted our kids, and we meant it for well, and we meant to do the right thing, but we carry guilt because of that. Probably all of us sitting here could think of five reasons off the top of our head that we carry a sense of guilt, real or imagined, we carry it with us. 
Someone told us we did wrong. We hurt someone and we shouldn't have said what we did. We hurt our family by choices we made and they were sinful choices. So many reasons to feel guilty. But as we think about guilt, we want God's perspective, the only correct perspective on any subject ever is what God has to say about it and God's viewpoint of it. There can be all kinds of opinions and all kinds of voices in society or wherever it may be. The only perspective that's ever correct is God's thoughts, God's perspective. And if we carry around a sense of guilt, first of all, understanding not ourselves, but God, understanding God is the key to freedom from guilt because it's God who removes our guilt and understanding him properly helps to remove our guilt. There are myths about God. For instance, one myth is, I know I'm guilty, I've done bad things. Before I come to God, before I present myself to him, I need to I need to do a spiritual shower of myself. I need to spiritually fix my hair and put on better clothing, so to speak, so that I can come and meet God. I have to be fully repentant and in the right place. I have to give up swearing or whatever it might be, clean myself up, and then I can present myself to God, which is not only unrealistic, it's unbiblical, because we cannot clean ourselves. We cannot prepare ourselves and make ourselves look better to God. He would see right through it. And it's God who leads us to repentance. It's God who alone can cleanse us from our sin. So one myth and one key to understanding God better and properly and who he truly is, is to understand we can come to him and we do come to him dirty and filthy rags, our sin all over us like mud thrown up on us, and we can't clean it off, we can't do better, we need him to do that, and we put our faith in Christ, and then he teaches us full repentance, and then we are beginning to be clean, and God forgives our sin, and then the Holy Spirit begins to cleanse and change us. Understanding God removes our guilt and we don't have to come to him all clean and ready because he's the one who cleanses us. Another myth about God, and it's also not true, is that God is the, the green monster guy. The green monster at Fenway Park has the guy behind it who puts up the numbers for what inning it is and puts up the, the numbers for what the score is, the hidden scorekeeper behind the wall in left field, the green monster. And we think of God as some sort of heavenly scorekeeper, keeping a score, watching us. Aha, you did it again, write it down. Like God is watching us moment by moment and condemning us constantly, keeping score over us, the secret run tallier. Listen to this about coming, about what God says. This is from Isaiah 43, verses 4 and 5, and then verse 25. Isaiah 43, 4 and 5, and then verse 25. Since you, you are precious and honored in my sight, because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you. Do not be afraid. I am with you. He will give people in exchange for us. He was looking ahead from the time of Isaiah to seven centuries later when he would give a person, God in human form, Jesus, to the cross in exchange for our soul, in exchange for our forgiveness from sin. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I love you. And then down in verse 25 of Isaiah 43, he says, I even I, I am he who blots out your sin. And listen to this. I remember them no more. I, God, remember your sin no more. 
People say, God can do anything. No, he cannot. He cannot lie. He will not deceive. He will not break his own moral commandments. He will not be motivated or do anything that is out of a place of unholiness because he is perfect in holiness and he cannot remember our sin that is forgiven. I am he who blots out your sin and remembers them no more. Understanding God lifts our load of guilt, takes away our shame. Understanding God properly and who he is takes away the guilt that we humans carry. Working on ourself won't take away our guilt. Understanding God and who he is and that he forgives us and he has authority takes away our guilt and our shame. We're consumed with guilt or with false guilt over our mistakes and sin. God has chosen to forget them. Do we know better than he does? Are we wiser than God that we're going to remember things that he says he's forgotten and therefore implying that we should forget it? Do we think we know better than God? No, we can look ahead. The past is the past. We are forgiven. We can move ahead. We may live in consequences of our choices and sin, but we are forgiven. Our screen is scrubbed clean. God does not remember our sins. Understanding him is the key to removing our shame and our guilt. And it's all because the grace of the cross sets us free. The grace of the cross sets us free. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were on a missionary journey, they were arrested. And as they sat in jail, God sent an earthquake. And where Paul and Silas were in the jail doors, you may know the story, came open. And the jailers were sh so shaken up by the earthquake, they ran in and said to Paul, what must we do to be saved? And Paul said this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you find salvation. Sin scrubbed away and removed. Forgiven from our sin. Our name written in the Lamb's book of life. Eternal life in heaven. Do we believe in God or do we believe in God and what he said? We're to believe what God has said. The grace of the cross removes our shame and our guilt. We are completely forgiven. He says, my son is ransom on your behalf. He is more than worthy to redeem you. He is infinite. He is perfect in holiness. And he's given his very life on the cross for the forgiveness of infinite little sinners. Your sin is paid for if you trust in him. You are set free. Paul wrote in Romans 10.9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, meaning forgiven, set free, the past scrubbed away and washed away clean. The verbs in Ephesians and other parts of the New Testament say we were rescued, we are being rescued, and we will be rescued. It's an ongoing work that God did, is doing, and will complete. And because God is the one who is doing it, it's the surest thing in all of thought and existence that God is rescuing us because the grace of the cross sets us free. Some churches, and this isn't to badmouth them, but some churches kind of in, deliberately induce into people a sense of guilt. They may give out rules, if not in a printed list, sort of verbally, and they induce guilt, and people have a sense that church leadership is kind of watching for infractions and will speak to them. I have a friend who attends a church where women may only wear skirts, not just in church, but in life, may only wear skirts, and they have other restrictions on the people, and they only use the King James Bible. They consider all others not inspired by God. 
So they have rules that they're focused on and that they're living. My friend, by the way, has a son and daughter-in-law who attend the same small church who haven't spoken to him in years. And the pastor says nothing to, to either party, makes no effort to bring them together. The rules are the focus. Charles Stanley said in his sermon, the centerpiece of the Christian life is the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. The grace of the cross, his sacrifice on the cross, sets us free from our guilt and our shame. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, go and sin no more. No lecture, no sermon, no listing of all her sin and what it meant and all, how God sees it. Simply go and sin no more. That's redirection. That is grace. She stood beside him, if you read the story, rather than running and hiding when she could have. She stood beside Jesus because she was believing and trusting in him. And all that was necessary was go and sin no more. Enjoy the grace and live in the grace I give you. We can let the past go. We can forgive ourselves for those things that we said, did, thought, how we impacted the lives of others. We can believe what God says when he says, I've forgotten your sin. Trusting in my son, you are fully forgiven forever because he is worthy, my son is worthy, his merit covers over the sin of all who trust in him. And so we who trust in him are changed and free. And we hopefully love to obey him because rules are a good thing, but we do it out of love and we enjoy the grace because our P-A-S-T is now P-A-S-S-E-D. Our past is past and no longer relevant. The grace of the cross sets us free. We have genuine guilt, things that we're responsible for and that we have done that were wrong, we're sinful before God. We have false guilt, things that we took on that we aren't really responsible for. But understanding God is not a scorekeeper looking to condemn us and say, I've got you. He's a God who loves and sent his son who died on the cross on our behalf and that his merit covers over our lack of merit, our sinfulness, means we are forgiven. He is greater than our sin. And therefore, lastly, we can believe in Christ and we can let go of the past and of our sin. We can believe in Jesus and what he has done for us, and we can let the past and our sin go. 1 John 1, verse 9. 1 John 1, verse 9 is the verse you want to quote when you get to the door of heaven. Why should we let you in? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How does that apply to guilt? Our favorite little Greek word is there, and no one can ever take it away. Pass, all, every one of, all unrighteousness, all our sin, no exception, is taken away. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, whatever it was, whatever we did, cleansed, pure, forgiven, all our guilt wiped away by the sacrifice of Christ and the mercy of God. You may know I'm a history buff and I read about our, our history as a country and our, our seventh president was Andrew Jackson who was one of the most influential people immediately in the generation after the founding fathers and mothers of our nation. And Andrew Jackson is why 
We have vast amounts of territory that are now taken for granted as part of our country. If it weren't for General Andrew Jackson driving the Spanish out, we wouldn't have the state of Florida. But because of Andrew Jackson, we have the state of Florida. It was Andrew Jackson during his time in office and after his time of office who got us the state of Texas, and because he did, the Spanish and the Mexicans went south, and the British left the Northeast. Everything west of the Mississippi, in a sense, is because of Andrew Jackson, the Battle of New Orleans, and getting the state of Texas on behalf of our country. Great achievements. He also supported and practiced slavery, a terrible abomination before God, and his policies carried over into the term of Van Buren led to the deaths of countless Native Americans, really unjustly. His achievements were great, or sins were great and vast against thousands and thousands of people. At the age of 75, in Nashville, Tennessee, in a church that he had paid to be built, he walked up the aisle on a Sunday morning after 20 years of reading the Bible every night owned by his wife, Rachel, who had passed away all those years ago, but who was a devout Christian. He read her Bible every night. And on this Sunday, Andrew Jackson walked to the front of the church, turned around, looked at the congregation, and said, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. And he was baptized with his daughter-in-law that day. How great our sins may be, but greater is the infinite blood of Christ shed on the cross for the remission of sin for you and me and countless millions and billions of people turning to Christ in the time in which we live. Greater than sin is the sacrifice of Jesus. Our, gu our guilt, our sin, our shame can be sent away because the cross of Christ is triumphant over all we have done. We have all sorts of reasons for guilt, faults, guilt. I should have been there. I shouldn't have gone to the playground. Honey, you're five years old. Or we can have real guilt. I shouldn't have done what I did in my marriage or in my family or in my workplace or drinking and driving or whatever it might be. Real reasons for guilt and shame we carry with us. Understanding God and who he is and what he has done for us and is doing for us is the key to forgiving ourselves and letting the past and what we have done go away. We can believe, we can trust in Christ, the victory is real, we may be forgiven for pass all unrighteousness, and we can send shame out the door. We can give guilt a one-way ticket to get on out of here and never return because he is sufficient. He is greater than. He has paid it all. And we are set free. Could we bow our heads for a moment? And I want to invite you to think about and probably all of us can conjure them up, I can. Things that we are guilty for, things that we carry guilt for, things that are in our past, recent or long ago, that continue to follow us and accuse us and rob us of peace. Father, thank you today that as we think of the things that rob us of our peace in terms of guilt and shame, things that were pinned on us or said to us or that we sincerely did and are responsible for. Thank you for Isaiah 43, verse 25. You remove our sin and remember it no more. Thank you that your son came into the world perfect in holiness, a full human and fully God in one being, 
able, therefore, to pay for the sin of fellow humans, infinite as God in holiness, to absorb and wipe away the sins of any and all, no matter the number, who look to him by faith. Thank you that we may trust in Christ and be forgiven and say goodbye to shame and guilt today, tomorrow, and forever. We trust in what you have said. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. said a lot of things that have hurt people. I've made decisions that were caused hardship in the lives of my kids or others. I've sinned before a holy God. Exhibit A, forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. We need not carry shame or guilt. We can trust in him and find full forgiveness. My prayer is that the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ would be yours in abundance. Amen.